The Mudshoot, the biggest city farm in the country. 32 acres of countryside right next to Canary Wharf. Home to sheep, pigs, goats and llamas. Hug it, can you hug? Oh, you have to farm, don't you? The farm's great fun for kids. It started as a piece of wasteland formed by the mud scooped out to make the docks. But it also contains four concrete bunkers that hold a secret to the mud chute's wartime past. The Blitz the German attempt to bomb Britain into submission started on the Saturday, the 7th of September, 1940. When the raids come on, we was in a pub, in a cellar, and all we did was bang, bang, bang all night, because right next to the dock we was, you know, the dock there. After a year of uneasy waiting, the German bombardment of London began in September and lasted until the 10th of May, 1941. At the heart of the bombing lay the Isle of Dogs and the mud chute. The, the sirens would go and then you knew when the planes were overhead really near you because you would hear the attack guns open up. Ah! And uh, then you think, oh, you know, we're in for a rough old night. The Isle of Dogs uh, anti-aircraft guns were part of a, a, a great system of anti-aircraft defences in this country. And they did force German planes to fly at a much greater altitude that prevented them from more accurate bombing. The Isle of Dogs was in the centre of London's dock system, a prime target for the bombers. The mud chute was next door to the Great Millwall and West India docks, and so offered a critical line of defence. There were four gun pits spaced across the mud chute, positioned for concentrated firepower. The guns were 4.5 inch naval guns that could fire a shell 30,000 feet in half a minute. They used to bang, you could hear them all over the place, you know, and you think there was bombs falling. When they went off on the mud chute, we had names for them. Big Ada, Big Bertha, Big Nelly. You got to know which ones, oh, that was Bertha, or that was, you got to know the sound. And when they went off, yeah, felt really safe. That, that was a good feeling. 70 years after the end of the war, an anti-aircraft gun is returning to the mud chute thanks to a generous grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund. At the start of the war, Britain used heavy 4.5-inch ACAT guns, which had to be in fixed positions. Later, however, they were replaced by 3.7-inch guns like this one, more manoeuvrable and faster. It could fire 10 rounds a minute and became the standard gun used against the German bombers. It, it is a real bit of history, this, this uh, 3.7 is the classic ACAC gun that defended uh, Britain during the Second World War. The problem at the moment is that we've got to get the wheels off uh, before we can actually lift it with a crane into the gun sight. Uh, the wheels are in the way and we don't actually want it on wheels because the, when the guns were fired and we want it to be in a firing position with its barrel pointing to the skies, waiting for the enemy raiders, all prepared sort of thing. Later, the eight-ton gun will have to be lifted into the gun sight, stood on its feet with the heavily rusted wheels removed and the metal bunker doors replaced. It's a pretty big job, actually. <laughs> I mean, a lot bigger than I thought, particularly as bits of it are shorn off. The immediate problem is the sheep have got out. Look, there are more of them coming out. Bloody hell. The Germans were attacking places like the Port of London, which I'd say was a vital artery. 70% of Britain's foodstuffs were coming from abroad. The merchant ships played a crucial role in keeping Londoners alive. 
Their engine rooms were largely manned by Bangladeshi seamen, many of whose descendants live in Tower Hamlets today. They too suffered terrible casualties when the docks were bombed. The bombers would identify the Isle of Dogs, use the loop of the river which they could follow on their route into London, although, as say, the city itself had been blacked out. In the year between the declaration of war and the start of the Blitz, people were busy preparing for the war. Public shelters were set up and sandbagged, and one and a half million London children were evacuated to the country. Everybody in Britain had been given a gas mask. 38 million had been distributed that, that autumn uh, as a form of personal protection. And then from February 1939, Anderson shelters were distributed either free, if you earned less than two pound 10 shillings, two pound 50 a week, or if you earned more than two pound 10 shillings, you had to buy one and they were pretty reasonably priced at four or five pound. The Anderson shelters were made of corrugated iron and were given to people who had yards or gardens, but they were cramped and cold and offered limited protection. Many people sheltered under these railway arches, including Daisy and her family of nine, who found their Anderson shelter too cramped. Because there was more people and more neighbours, so we started to come here and just sort of have a sing song. This is what remains of the bunk beds. That was where my mum slept, I slept, and we felt safe. I mean, it's ridiculous, really. We used to sing loud, really all loud. And the song, well, one of the songs was uh, by Hutch, Begin the Begin, because it was a lively song and we tried to close out the noise of the guns and the aircraft. Daisy's own house was bombed. Luckily, no one was killed. When they begin the begin, it brings back the song of music so tender. Not only were they attacking the dock installations, places like the Isle of Dogs, the Pool of London, they were also targeting the homes of dock workers and their families. Them incendiary bombs, I dropped everywhere. Uh, People used to come and say, there's a fire there, there's a fire, I've caught fire there. Opposite us in the flats, when we lived in the flats, they dropped through and burnt the bedroom out. You'd think there was hundreds, hundreds dropping, all the, in baskets. What a tough cocktail, they called them. And they used to drop all over the place, fires all over the place. All round Wapping was ablaze for warehouses. Oh yeah, of course it was. I remember the night the city burnt. We was only kids, and our old dad took us out, and he showed us, he said, look at the sky. And you could see the sky was red, honestly, absolutely red, from the city of London. There was a night when I was standing in this sort of doorway, and the whole of London was on fire in a big circle. And I can recall standing there looking, thinking, it's like a cake, there's no space. Daisy's uncle, Frank, a chief air raid warden, was killed by a firebomb. The guns became vital in keeping up people's morale. The gun, the 3.7, was one of the mainstays of the British anti-aircraft command. That's where the shell, actually, the anti-aircraft shell actually goes in there and then is fired through the barrel, hopefully hitting a German aircraft. But uh, unfortunately, that was not always the case. In fact, uh, they were very lucky if they got a, a hit. The rooms here, if that's the right word to describe them, uh, was the storage space for the ammunition for the guns and for the personal equipment of the anti-aircraft gun crews. The firing of the gun was controlled from a central radar post which tracked the German planes as they came towards London. The gun was manned by men of the 154th ACAC battery from the 52nd Artillery Regiment. On the 8th of September, there was a new intake of recruits. 
were to have a baptism of fire. That night, the mud chute came under ferocious bombardment. Incendiary bombs destroyed the dormitory block and the radar control post, and also badly damaged the canteen and the vital access road. Amazingly, no one was killed. Fires raged everywhere. Under terrifying conditions, their commander, Captain Fletcher, urged the men to continue firing. Later, Captain Fletcher went out onto nearby streets to dismantle the incendiary bombs. The whole unit was commended for its bravery and Captain Fletcher received the Military Cross, the only one awarded for gallantry on British soil. The Blitz lasted eight long months. Around 30,000 Londoners were killed, including 430 dead and 1,600 badly injured on the Isle of Dogs alone. Even the church was destroyed. I had an uncle killed and a cousin killed at Poplar, which landed outside their house, a couple of, about 100 yards away. They killed our Annie and her father. You really realised it, like when you used to go round and you see people laying on the pavement dead and things like that, when they used to take them out and lay them out. You see them put them in dust carts and take the bodies away. You know, in the east end of London, it was really rough, honestly. Nine pubs were destroyed. The most frightening bombs were the doodle bugs, or flying bombs that cut out just before they landed. When you didn't hear the noise, and there was that deadly silence, You'd hold your breath then, but when it went off, you felt for the people who it had caught, but you breathed a sigh of relief simply because you were still there. Anybody who come through it realises now that we was lucky. You was lucky to get through it, yeah. By 1945, 75% of the houses on the Isle of Dogs were deemed unfit for habitation. It was dubbed the District of the Dead. The population fell from 20,000 to just 9,000. The arrival of the gun at the Mudshoe is a chance for local schools, including these children with learning difficulties, to find out about their community during World War II. This is a, a group of students that come from George Green's. They come for 38 weeks of the year. And at the moment, this year, we're studying uh, World War II. Anybody know what that is, an incendiary bomb? Was it a bomb that just went boom and took all the, all the buildings down? Or was it a, like a fire bomb? We've got a work party of, of lads that come over to the farm and they're actually cleaning up parts of the gun site. The day has finally arrived for the gun to be moved back into the original gun emplacement. Hang on, hang on. Yeah, that's about right there now. Now just get it level again like before. It's hard for young people to realise, after France fell to the Germans, just how close Britain came to losing the war. I feel so pleased and proud that they've got the gun back here because uh, it made us feel safe with the guns on the mud chute. And it got sort of frightening when you used to think of the German tanks coming down the street. And that used to be my main fear, really. I always expected to see German tanks coming down. I'm really grateful that they've got a gun back here because the children wouldn't know what it looked like. If it wasn't for these guns, the generation wouldn't be here at all. It's wonderful in a sense to have brought it back here because what it does, it reminds people in fact of the history of this place and it'll remind children 
of today about the terrible uh, history of that time and that the mud chute, which was literally treeless and just covered with ACAC batteries, uh, now is actually full of woods, ponds, and has this wonderful inner city farm, which is the biggest inner city farm in the country. It's beautiful, absolutely, and it's just on the Isle of Dogs and it's ours. <laughs> <laughs>